So uh, you all must be wondering what this is all about. So this is a talk that's not my idea. I got it from someone else. Who knows what, what a kata is, this idea. I've heard about that concept before in programming. Anybody? Hands? Nobody? Okay, so a kata is basically the idea of taking a simple programming problem and trying to kind of just solve it on your free time. Like 10, 15 minute problems that just uh, to kind of keep your mind engaged. So what I wanted to look at today is, is a kata, is a simple programming problem and seeing how we're going to work about solving it. And the problem we're going to be looking at is factorial. Now, uh, who doesn't know what a factorial is? Okay. Congratulations, you have... Okay, two doesn't know what a factorial is. So um, for uh, two's sake, a factorial is when you have... Let's say you have... Uh, the factorial of, uh, it'll probably be a function here. Let's see, scientific. Uh, anybody see it? Where? There we go. So a factorial is when I, for example, say 5 factorial, it gives you 120. And what that means, it's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. Similarly, if we say 10, 10 factorial, let's say 10 factorial, it's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way to 10. So you can already kind of think, how would we solve this problem? What's the kind of things we can do? You might probably think you just have a variable and loop through the numbers and multiply it with itself. Maybe you are on the functional spectrum and you think this is definitely a thing for recursion. Anyway, so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at how to solve this very simple problem. Now, the, the twist is we're going to look at three different languages. Um, the languages we're going to look at are assembly, and C, and Haskell. Now these three programming languages are probably as different as three programming languages can be. The one looks at very close to the metal, very almost uh, machine code programming. The second is uh, what we call a high-level program language, that's C, which is you have a compiler that will compile to machine code. And then we have Haskell, which is literally, and is, as I think, maybe even coined the term of calling itself a very high-level language. That is so abstract that when you write a program, you're not really telling the computer what to do. You're just kind of describing the problem, and the compiler and the, the type system kind of figures it out. So we're going to look at these things to kind of see how they're different, to see how the different ways that you uh, would solve a problem in these three languages, and maybe get some insights as to uh, how different ways are that you, that you can think about programming. Because most of us are programming in something like C Sharp or JavaScript, which are paradigm languages. Now, all three of these languages, Assembly, C, and Haskell, are not multi-paradigm languages, although you can probably get into an argument about someone about that. But they very much have their thing. You cannot have a lambda expression in, in Assembly. That's simply not even a concept. You cannot have it in C. But in Haskell, that's pretty much what you've got. So each of these languages have a very specific bent to what they're trying to do, especially Haskell, which was they kind of very... Um, the people who made Haskell were very kind of unrelenting about making a pure functional programming language. A pure functional programming language is a programming language where every function cannot have side effects. That means you cannot do something that's console.write because that will create a side effect. And so they found very interesting ways to get around this problem. And we're going to look at that. We're also going to look at what are the challenges in each of these different programming languages. Uh, because some things are going to be easier in one programming language than another. Some things, there are going to be advantages to one programming language over another. Uh, some things are going to be easy in one that's hard in another, and something that's hard in one that's easy in another. We're going to look at that. Um, and so uh, let's get started. And uh, before I continue, I should maybe just uh, start the recording, which I'll get in trouble if I don't start it. I was going to start it, but then I got carried away. <laughs> Let's see. I have to run it in a very specific way. I have to run it like that, otherwise it doesn't work. With integrated graphics. There we go. Um, I need this. This is my capture. There we go. And we are in Salvador Dali land. That's awkward. 
Okay, there we go. So, I have written all the code, and uh, it's on GitHub, and I'll share the link afterwards. But um, some of the coding that I'm going to do will be uh, copy and paste, because some of it is so difficult that there's no way I can write it while you guys are watching me. And uh, some of it we'll kind of think about how we can do it. So what I'm using is Windows, but I'm using the Windows subsystem for Linux. It's really Linux. Um, in case you're confused as to why I've got a bash shell in Windows. Um, so let's make a new folder. Real time. And uh, let's start with the, uh, I, the languages are, are very different, but they're also very different in time. So assembler is kind of what is programmed, the, the thing that guys programmed in the maybe 70s, 80s, early 90s. Uh, some people still do it today because they think they're better than compilers. And then you get C, which is, what, what's it? Who knows what's the date that um, C was invented? Because, okay, Derek knows. In the 70s. <laughs> Unix. And then we've got Haskell, which was invented in 1990. Well, first release or something was 1995. So there's a different time. They're all really old languages. So Haskell is the youngest, which is 20 years old. Um, so they're really old languages, but they are separated in time. So let's start with the oldest one, uh, assembly. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, that won't work. I'm going to start Visual Studio Code, and we can look at some code. Um, let me just do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, for Assembler, um, there you have a few options of how you can do this. Um, but what, what I'm going to be using is uh, an Assembler called NASM. Who has heard of NASM or worked with NASM? A few people. Great. We're going to use NASM. Uh, we're going to use Intel syntax. And nobody cares about what those things are. But basically, what we've got is... Um, we're going to program that uh, we've got some sec We're basically we write a very simple program. We're, we're going to have two sections. We're going to have code. That's in the section called text, paradoxically. And we've got data. Now, because we're writing an assembler, it's very close to the processor. It's not as close as you might think. And this is one of the things I've learned, is you would think that this stuff just goes directly to machine code. And it does. Uh, each one of these generates an instruction, but the assembler does actually quite a lot in the background to make it work. And, but that being said, you can assume that, and we're going to look at that, we're going to look at the binary code that this generates, but you can assume that this will be Intel x64 instructions. We're going to do 64-bit assembly. Um, <coughs> so we've got two sections because the processor kind of has two different things that it cares about. It cares about instructions and it cares about data. <coughs> so we've got um, uh, our code, and this is all the code. There's quite a lot of it because there's only one instruction per line. And then we've got some data. In the data, all that we have is a temporary buffer and a message. You can see what the message is. It shows you what the usage is. That 0AH, that's the new line character. Now, um, if you were to think, how are we going to write the factorial program in assembly, um, you would kind of think, let's, let's think about it. If I were to write a program that says factorial, that's a, let's say that's a label, and that's, you could kind of think of that as a procedure. That's the closest thing you will have to a procedure in assembly is a label, um, which if you don't like go-tos, then assembly is, is really not going to work for you. So let's say we have a, a procedure called factorial, and we want to write it in assembly. So let's think about how we would do that. We would take parameters. Now, there's a thing that you have to think about when you're writing assembly, which you don't think about in pretty much every other programming language, and that is calling conventions. When you call a procedure, how do you pass it arguments? Like on a machine code level, how do you do that? Does it go into the registers? Does it go into the stack? Um, how do you think about these things? Now, when you're programming something like C Sharp, C Sharp, by the way, only has a stack. It's a stack machine. So arguments are going to go into the stack. If you've got a 64-bit processor, the 64-bit uh, Intel specification actually tells you how you should do it. They kind of try to nail it down. But it doesn't, hasn't always been that way. And we, 
writing assembly don't have to have any kind of calling convention. So we can decide, how do you want to pass arguments? So there are two arguments that we care about, the input to the factorial function and the output. And uh, we're simply going to say, that this is a comment, um, we'll take RAX, the, which is the accumulator register, um, and just put, take the input from RAX and put the output in RAX. Sounds pretty simple. So normally you would like think about, am I going to push it on the stack? What am I going to do? But we're just not going to care about that. We're just say our function. Our function is going to work like this. It's going to take the RAX register and do factorial, and the result will be in the RAX register. And so that's simply what we'll do. By the way, uh, there are four. Uh, who knows how many registers there are on a 64-bit system? Well, I don't know either. It's tons. You've got A, B, C, and D, the A, B, C, and D registers, which thinks you might think they're called A, B, C, and D because it's alphabetical, but they actually all have specific purposes. So they're called the general purpose registers, but they have specific usages. We've got the accumulator. We've got the B, which I don't know. It's called for something, base pointer. No, it's not the base pointer. Anyway, you've got the counter. You've got the data one. And then you've got the base pointer. You've got your stack pointer. You've got like a whole ton of registers. And then 64-bit system also has 8, 9, 10, all the way to 15 or 16. But um, that aside, we're just going to be focusing on one register. We've got taking one register in, we'll return one register, and we can basically play with the other registers. And because it's our assembly program, we can choose how we mess up the other registers or whatever we do. So let's say how are we going to do this. Um, we cannot really... There, you, you will start to realize when you start programming assembly that all sorts of nuances to the operating set that you don't maybe realize. For example, we cannot do this. Um, we, we cannot do this. We cannot multiply something with 5 because that's not how the multiply instruction works. The multiply instructions multiplies the RAX register with whatever you're putting in here. So the RAX, uh, so the multiply function only takes one uh, argument. It doesn't take two the way that you would think. It's not a function. It's an it's a instruction. So w uh, if we think about how we would do this, what we would need to do, if you can think about this, we will have to loop. We can do it recursively, but that's just being difficult. This is assembly. That's we're just going to make our lives difficult that way. So what we're going to do, we're going to loop through something. So we're going to loop. How many times do we loop? Well, we're going to move RA, we're going to loop RAX times. So let's let's start with that. We say move, um, let's you uh, like that. We're going to put um, RAX and RCX and keep it there, because remember RAX is the accumulator. That's going to be the result of our multiplication. So all that we're going to do is we're going to um, loop over RCX. So that, let's say we call this factorial five. RCX now has five. We'll just uh, loop until RCX is zero and just multiply the whole time. So you would do something like though, like this. RCX and then loop factorial. Okay? So that's kind of the basic thing that we're going for. Now, for those of you who don't know, what the loop instruction does is it, it, will, it will jump to the label that you specify until RCX is zero. So if RCX is 5, it'll loop until it, until it goes 0, and then it'll continue out. So in other words, if it was 5, it will come in. It will say, um, actually, we need to do this um, again. So if we were to do this, what would happen is we'll start with RX5, RCX is 5, and it will come in. It will multiply our, uh, RX with RCX. You already see this kind of becomes a bit annoying, but let's, this is the general idea. It will loop, it will multiply, then it will go again. RCX will be decremented. Now it's 4, it will multiply again. 3, 2, it will multiply again. 1, and the loop command will decrement. It will now be zero, it will go over, and it will return. So that's kind of the basic idea. But we need to have more instructions than that. So I'm going to take the full function, and, you and we'll, we'll investigate. But that's the basic idea. It's not many more instructions. So this is the actual function. And so here's what it does. <coughs> First of all, it tests. Because we have a special case. Because what is factorial zero? It's one, annoyingly. It's not zero. And if you care about math, I'm sure that 
uh, you know there are all sorts of interesting and not very exciting reasons for that. Um, but for our program's case, all that we know is we have a special case. Now, if you're writing this in Haskell, you won't have a special case because Haskell is crazy. But we have a special case. So we need to test. And what we're going to do is we're going to test Rx. And when you call the test command, it basically compares the two variables and sets some flags. What it's, uh, the flag that it's going to set for us is going to tell us if um, Rx is 0 or not. We're just going to look at the 0 flag. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do that move that we considered. Uh, we're going to put rcx as our count. Then um, we're going to make rx 1. Because if we keep it the way it is, we'll multiply 5 by itself one too many times. So we start with 1. And then uh, what we do is we, that's, that's called jump if 0. So we test it up here. We test it up here. We can't test down here because over here we're overriding the rx which is annoying. So we test up there. It sets the flag. None of these two commands will change the flag. All that we're going to do is we're going to jump to the return if our AX is 0. In other words, it sets the result to 1, and then it jumps out. And then we have our special case. It's 1. But if it's not our special case, it's not going to jump. It's going to come in here, and it's going to multiply by RCX. So let's, let's say our RAX is 5. It'll go 5. <coughs> goes again, 4. Goes again, 3 all the way down to 1, goes again, loop will decrement it to 0, and that will return. So that's our function. It will, it will do that. Now, how do we turn this? So we've written the factorial little function. It's like how many instructions? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If you're more smarter than me, you can probably get it down, maybe. But that's 6 instructions, 7 if you include the return. For our factorial function, all it does is it factorials Rax. Very simple. Um, in assembly. I can promise you this, none of the other programming language will get it down to six instructions, unless you do something very weird in C or something. Um, so that's cool. Now, uh, that's great, right? Close to the metal, we've optimized as far as it can go on the first try. So how do we turn this into a program? Well, we're going to find out very quickly that there are some things needed. So le let me copy out the main routine. This is the entry point, and we'll kind of see how it goes. OK, so I'm copy this out, and let's look at it quickly. We'll see, realize we need some more things. Because remember what we don't have. We don't have any kind of library. We don't have anything. We don't have a function to, for example, <coughs> print something to a file. How are we going to print something to the screen? How are we going to read something from the parameters that come in? That all will now be down to the operating system. So talk about platform specific. We were writing this program for an x64 Linux uh, machine. It cannot run on anything else. We cannot, we cannot even compile it for anything else. Um, it's pretty much what it is. So let's look at how it works. So first thing is we need to get arguments from the command line because we want to run our program like this. We want to run it like factorial and 5 and it doesn't exist yet, but the results should then be like 120. If we run it like factorial 0, the results should be 1. And if we run it without arguments, it should print us out, hey, this is how you use the program. So um, that suddenly becomes a pretty daunting task. And you might be wondering, how do we do all those things in assembly? So first of all, like I said, it's platform specific. So we're going to get this stuff from the operating system. When we ask how to get the, the arguments, we need to know how the operating system is going to pass those arguments. So in Linux, this is how it's going to do it. It's going to put argc on the stack. The argc is the number of arguments. It's going to put the number of arguments on the stack. And then behind it, it's going to push all the arguments on the stack. Now, uh, DOS, for example, I know it doesn't work like this. DOS, for example, what you have is you have a special address where it stores the startup information for the process. Linux, we've got this. If you write it for, for Unix, it will be different. And this is kind of one of the challenges you have. So let's look at our program. It's going to pop uh, the, the number of arguments off the stack and put it in the count register. It's going to check if there's two or more. The reason we're checking for two is because the first argument is going to be the, the path to the executable. So we need to skip that one. It checks if it's less than two. If it's less than two, it jumps to print usage. The print usage is down here. All it does is it does some things. It calls the write function, which we'll get to, and then it exits. Um, but let's get to that later. Then what it does is it adds 8 to the stack pointer. What that does is it skips argument number 0 to argument number 1. Then we pop off 
The, the, the second argument, which is the number that I would have put in there, it pops it off and it puts it in RSI, which RSI is the source register for string operations. <coughs> then what it does is it calls a function, which we're going to look at, to convert a number, uh, to convert a string, because right now, remember, I'm passing it a number, but it's not a number, it's a string, like 5345. But in memory, it's actually going to be 5345 with a null terminating character. So that's rather inconvenient if we want to multiply it. Um, so we need to call a function called a to i, which, which I named because that's what the n it's called in C, but whatever. It will convert uh, the register RSI to a number and store it in RAX. Then, conveniently, it's in RAX, we call our factorial function. It will take RAX and factorial it with itself and we, we store the result in RAX. Then we need to do something else. We move RDI, which is the destination for string operations, we put it as buffer. Now buffer, I don't have yet, because that is in our data section. So I'm going to copy the data section over quickly. So we put the data section. There we go. Uh, there's buffer. Buffer is just times 30, 0. So it's just a temporary space. In C, what, what this is, the, if we were in C, this would be a global static variable, a, a global variable. We don't have any local variables because we don't have variables at all. We have registers, we have a stack. <coughs> so let's move on. So I move RDA, RDI, which is the destination for string operations, and I point it to buffer. So it's going to be a pointer. It's going to point to the memory location of buffer down there. And the, the assembler figures out how to repoint all of this. Then um, what it does is it calls i to a, which, as you may imagine, takes a number in RAX and puts it in the buffer as a string. So uh, then lastly, what it does is it prints it to screen by calling write a function, which we'll get to. So um, that seems all good and well. So that's basically how our application works. So quite a lot more steps goes into the nitty gritties than the factorial function, which is really annoying. Uh, and I will show you now how much more it is. So we've got two functions that we need to deal with, a to i and i to a. So how do we convert the string to a number in assembler? That's, you can maybe think, uh, well, basically, you can maybe imagine it will be something like divided by 10, uh, or let's say, let's start with a to i. That would be, you take the number, <coughs> you take the last character, <coughs> Excuse me, take the last character, you kind of see what its character value is, you do some math to figure out what the number value is, and then you put it in, in the register, you add it, then you multiply it by 10, stuff like that. And the truth is, this is what it looks like. So um, let me move up to it. So I'm going to copy A to I, and I to A, and then we'll briefly look at it and we'll see you pay something when you use something like assembler. <laughs> and like, the good thing about assembler is you can write something in assembler and then link to it from something like C or C++ or even something like Go or Rust or even Haskell probably. Um, but if you're going to go straight assembler, you need to do stuff like this. So convert a string to a number, a string at uh, RSI, output to RAX. Here we go. <coughs> First, it's zeros to registers. By the way, if you're ever in assembly and you see that, XOR something with itself, what happens if you XOR something with itself? Well, it kind of gives it away. All the numbers become zero because they're all the same. So that's kind of a thing that people do. Instead of moving something to zero, which, I don't know, is it slower? But everywhere I've seen compilers do this, and people who write assembly also do, set, do this, XOR something with itself sets it to zero. So it's zeros to registers, and it moves ICX to 10, which is our base. We've got a base 10. We take the numbers as base 10, not something else. And then we do stuff. Um, we move stuff out of the character. We check if it's null. We've got lots of checks exiting. We exit if it's, because now we need to handle the error cases. This is less than the character zero. But basically, this is what we do. We subtract the character zero from the number, which will basically be, uh, because it comes in as ASCII, but we subtract the ASCII part. So we'll have 0 to 10, 0 to 9 in, in the register then. Then what it does is it um, 
uh, it, what does it do? It compares it just to check, and what it does is it multiplies it by 10, and remember, multiply works, it stores it in the RAX register, and then it adds it. So it just puts it in from the back, multiplies it, puts it in from the back, multiplies it, until we reach the end of the string. This checks for zero because we've got the null terminating character, and then it returns. So that's our A to I function. Annoyingly complicated. If you, um, like imagine, imagine none of these comments were here and you needed to figure out that's what this function does. Which I've done that, by the way. I, I, I kind of have, uh, like I disassemble old games and try and figure out how they work. This is annoyingly difficult to figure out what a function does if it doesn't have comments in assembler. So remember, you know how people are like these days, you shouldn't comment your code because the code kind of should explain itself. Not, not in this. <laughs> You're going to need some comments. That's why assembler source code is so important because you don't know what it does from the machine code. It's, it's so difficult to go through machine code and figure out what it does. So let's sort of the converting an integer to, an, to a string. That's even harder. It's like all this. And, and basically all it does is it divides something by 10 and takes the remainder and puts it in the string. But the problem is it does it in reverse. So remember, when you, you, got, you start with the least significant digit, which should be at the back. So the way that I did it here is I actually put it on the stack without changing the stack pointer. So I actually copy the stack pointer out, and then I keep, uh, and, and I support, added support for negative numbers, which in which case it should add a minus in the front. Now imagine that, you're starting with a number but you're starting at the back, and if it's negative, which is something you only know in the beginning, you need to put it at the, at the end. So anyway, it loops, um, and then basically it does, it, it, it puts something at, at the, on the stack point, RSI, which is set to the stack pointer, and then it decreases it the whole time, so it moves backwards, which is uh, convenient because the stack works backwards, so it can do that. And then all it does at the end, it copies it out. Now the thing about Intel, so Intel processors are what you call a CISC processor, a complex instruction set processor. Which means in the processor, all of these instructions are written out to even smaller, simpler instructions. So it has stuff like this, repeat move SB, which is one instruction which loops over something and basically that instruction copies the string. So that's interesting. So how it works, so, so we've copied it into the stack, then we copy it, and then what we do is we basically have the length, it's in, uh, if you compare the stack pointer to RSI, it's the length, you loop, you've got the count, you've subtracted two, you've got the count in RCX, you have, uh, I'm saving that because it's going to be modified by this instruction. You've got the count in RCX, you've got your destination in RDI, remember it's the destination with string operations. This function will take RSI and copy it to RDI RCX times. And that's what it does, that one instruction. And then it kind of restores your RCX because you, we need it for the next function and it returns. And so that function does that. So there we have it, that's our program. Um, <coughs> Then uh, the only question that remains is, how do you print something to the screen? Now, um, the reason I chose Linux is because Linux is simple. In Windows, it's not simple to do this, because you need to call an external function and link to a DLL, and that's annoying. But in Linux and operating systems like it, you call an interrupt to call something that's called a syscall. Now, I'm going to quickly Google it. Linux syscalls. So Linux has a reference to all the syscalls that it has. And this is it. So this is why something like, I don't know if you've ever worked with Docker containers, but you can have a Docker container with only an executable in it. How does that work? How can you have an executable that talks to the operating system without referencing any operating system files? That's because the unique way that, well, not really unique, but the special way that Linux works is the only way that you talk to the operating system is through interrupts. So it's got these syscalls. It's got uh, about 400 of them. This thing is old. I think it's from a very old um, uh, version of the Linux kernel, but it's got like 337 syscalls. So these are the syscalls we need to use, and basically how it works is you can see there, you can maybe zoom it in a bit, it's telling you how to call the syscall on a very basic level. It tells you, put this in EAX, and, and this in this register, that register, these are the arguments, and then you call a specific interrupt, and it will 
and we'll do the syscall. The interrupt is interrupt 80, 80 hex. And that's how it works. And so that's how all the Linux syscalls work. Now, I learned this the hard way and literally did not know this until yesterday, but this is only for 32-bit processors, <laughs> which is interesting. On a 64-bit processor, they added a special instruction to do this. It's called the syscall instruction, which basically does the same thing. But another thing that I then didn't know is they changed everything. That reference doesn't work for 64 processors. You need to, know, need to go look for a different one. So we've got this one. Fortunately, you Google it. It's just one link away. Um, and this is the one we need to use. So here we go. There's the same syscall, but it tells you the 64-bit registers you need to use. So let's say we want to write something. This is the one we need to use. So it's very simple then. We put 1 in RAX. We put the destination, what we want to write to, which is a file descriptor, a descriptor in RDI. And we put the source buffer pointed to the source buffer in RSI and the number of bytes to RDX. And then you call the syscall instruction and it'll do it. Now, RDI, we want to print to standard out, which is the console output. That's kind of what your program will produce. And fortunately for us, that's a constant. It's a constant of 1. So that's what we've got here. We've got move 1 to RAX, which is the syscall number. We've got move RDI to 1, which is standard out. And we've got RSI is uh, what we're copying from and the length. And so that's how it works. Then it calls syscall. The next thing that we do down here is another syscall. It's syscall 60, and let's look for it. Number 60, that's exit. It's got an error code, which I didn't even bother with. So we use those two syscalls to do something as simple as writing to the console and exiting the program, which is interesting nuance, considering in C, you don't even have to worry about what platform it is. It just works. The Linux headers have all this already in it. But let's see if we can build this, this assembly program that we've written. Let's see if I've... Actually, let me just skip that because we don't want to be here forever. I'm just going to do this. So how do we build an assembly program? I'm going to call it NASM. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do this. Paste. NASM, I've got my input file, output file. I've got the format. Run it. Uh, there we go. There we go. And then it produces this. It produces a listing file. The listing file looks like this. It tells you basically what instructions it generated. You can see there's our code. And here it says this. That's what it generated. So you can see there's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping to instructions that I put in text file and what it put will put in the binary file. And the, object, the O file is the object file. So before we can run this program, we need to link it. And that's done with... Uh, this instruction, it basically says that's the entry point, produce that executable, go. We go, and there we have it. So we have our factorial program, and there we run. It tells us the usage, and if we put in 5, it puts in 120. That's, that's a bit cut off. Let me do that. There we go. So the, I said I would work on the top, but you don't really have control over that, do you? It's going to be at the bottom. So um, factorial 5. We go around factorial 5, result is 120. Now, there are some problems with something like factorial. What if we put in factorial 1,000? The result is 0. Ouch. What if you put factorial 30? The result is minus uh, stuff. That's because we just use registers. Now, we've got a 64-bit register, which means we can go pretty high. We can go up to 20. We've got that big number, but we're limited by the fact that we're so close to the architecture. Anyway, so that's a simpler. Let's move on to something a bit simpler. Um, I'm going to just open the other one. Oh, my goodness. Not this one. This one. Let's move on to C. Now, in C, it's going to be a bit simpler. Let's zoom out a bit. So this is a high-level language, but it's, in comparison to the languages we're used to today, still pretty low level. Uh, you could have written this code maybe 30 years ago. And so here's our factorial program, a function. It, it takes an integer, returns an integer. If it's 0, return 1, our special case again, else just, and now we use recursion because it looks cool. 
We can use the loop, but it's recursion. Um, <coughs> that's, that's a real programmer is always use recursion if they can. And then you program for five or six or seven years, and then you start taking the recursion out of all your programs. Like, who, what idiot wrote this recursive program? Nobody knows what it does. And then, and then once you've worked for programming for 10 years, then you go into functional programming, and then everything's in back to recursion. And then probably later you realize that's stupid. Anyway, this is recursive. It works. Number times number minus one. We start with our exit criteria, and that's how it works. Now we have nice functions, A to I, which is in the standard C library, which I don't have to worry about anymore. The compiler just does it like magic. It, I've got printf, which I just print print f and it shows me. I just print f and it converts a number to a string like magic. I don't have to worry about any of that. I went from 170 lines of code to just 30 in just, well, how many years? Actually, assembly language, x86 assembly language, isn't, I think, that much older than C. So people kind of stuck with assembly language because they didn't like high-level programming languages. Anyway, uh, how do we build this? That's also a bit simpler. We just call GCC, which is the GNU compiler collection. We take the input file, the output file, and magic. I'm going to go back to, uh, where, where are we? Did I close it? Oh, no. Start Ubuntu again. Um, projects. One card. There we go. We just copy paste that command in. It builds, and we've got our program. That was far. That required far less explaining than the assembly one, right? But we still have our problems. It cannot do 20. Why? Because I just used int. If I wanted to use a, a 64-bit integer, I need to put like unsigned, long, long, and then you start running into interesting problems as well because. <coughs> uh, C has its own nuances of how it handles things such as overflows and so on. And uh, this I to A function, well, that one's only going to produce an int, isn't it? Unless I use a different function to do longs. So you see, we had some things in assembler that we now have to worry about that we didn't have to worry about before. When writing an assembler, you're working with registers. You know what you've got. Right now, it's an int. What's an int? That differs from platform to platform. Uh, it differs from comp the compiler handles it differently based on what flags you set. Is it going to throw an exception when you do an overflow? Is it just going to ignore it? So there's a lot of stuff that you kind of you, you gain a lot. You, you trust me, you gain a lot more than you lose, but you do lose something. You lose the fact that you now um, have a little bit less control, and this is why people still program assembly language because they just want that control. Anyway, so there we have a C program. Now, there's something else that's different. Let's see how big that program is. We have got a program. It's 8 kilobytes. How big do you think the assembly language program is? It's 1.6 kilobytes. That's four times as large. And I tell you what, that program is 1.6 kilobytes with debug information because I couldn't figure out how to get NASM to take it out. But the, the code itself, that listing file, which is 8 kilobyte, and let's show it. This that you see here, you see every time it shows hex there, that's when it generates instructions. That's it. It's about like only 600 or 700 bytes worth of instructions. And I want to show you because I have something magical on my computer called IDA. Who knows what IDA is? Hands up. IDA, anyone? Who knows what this program is? Okay, if you want to go into security, you're going to need this program. It's called the Interactive Disassembler. It's a program you use to reverse engineer programs. So let's open up our factorial file. This is the assembly one. Okay, no, I don't care about that. Just go back to text view. It tries to be fancy, like it had that. Like this is our program that we wrote in assembly. It's got this nice little diagram. It's pretty cool, right? You never use that in real life. It's like not <laughs> useful at all. Um, but it looks cool. <laughs> anyway, here's our program, and, and if you paid a lot of attention, you will note it's the exact same program that we had earlier. The reason it has that red is because when you write assembly, uh, this disassembler is expecting something that was built with a compiler, and if you write an assembly language, you do weird things like this function doesn't have a return because that thing will just exit. 
Um, but you can see here, this is our program. It disassembled it. We see if we scroll down, here's our data. There's our 30 blank bytes. And here you can see usage factorial. There's our data section. And that's it. Let, let me turn to the X view. That's our entire program in what we write in assembly. It's like, that's it. How, much, how many bytes is that? That's like 200x. Uh, what's that? 160, like 300, 400 bytes. Of the, and that's our program. Let's open up the C one. Um, don't save. Nobody cares. Let's see what we got with the C one. Star factorial. Nine kilobytes because it's slightly bigger on disk. It detects that it's a Linux binary file, but other than that, not much. I open it. It's going to ask me again, do I want to see the proximity view? And here's our program again. Look fancy, little graph. Um, let's go back to the text view. Immediately, we will see there is more code. There is more as machine code than there was before, a lot more, even though it seems that there's a lot less. You see this to the left? That's all the functions it found in the file. Now, we called A to I and printf, but it's also got put s. It's got uh, frame dummy, registered TM clones, all sorts of stuff that, the, that the, com the compiler and the standard C library put in there. There's our main function. And you will notice it kind of does this thing where it puts things, it uses the base pointer for variables. We don't just use registers anymore, the, uh, wherever we want. Um, it's, it's a lot more machine code. If we look at the hex view, this is the program in hex. It is way bigger than it was before. It's got a lot more stuff in it. Um, <coughs> and that's kind of one of the things you play. But there's another thing. These functions down here are external. Um, they're in a different li in a different file. They, they're you, uh, dynamic is dynamically linking the standard C library. So A to I and printf, those things are referenced here, but they're actually in a different, different file. So there's a lot of code that you don't see. <coughs> a lot of instructions that you don't see because we, we maybe could write a function that is as simple as, the, as printing out to the console using just a syscall. But we chose to use printf, which, uses, which has a lot of stuff that it brings with it. So that's the kind of thing that you see happen when you use something like C. And this is C. This has been around 30 years. It's called, I mean, if you use C sharp, there's worlds of difference between this and C sharp. But even so, you can see there's a lot of stuff that get added. Unfortunately, today, processes are so fast that even if you run it a million times in parallel, you won't find an appreciable difference in speed between what C produces and what assembler produces. But now imagine you're used to writing assembler, and you move to a compiler, and it starts generating all this stuff. You can see why people kind of were hesitant to adopt high-level languages. Anyway, that's C. But let's move on to something quite different, Haskell. How do you write factorial in Haskell? That's how. <laughs> it's one line. It's not the only way you can do it also. There's a guy who made a website. I couldn't find it. But he took 50 different ways that you can write factorial in Haskell. It's, it's crazy. You can write it like, like this. Factorial 0 equals 1. Factorial n equals n times factorial n minus 1. That's a different way to do it. And you can also put a case statement in there and do, the, do it like we did it in C. But that's not fancy enough. You can just say, like, wow, let's check that out. It's just one line. Product 1 to n. Just take 1 to n and multiply it with itself. So let me open up um, the GHC environment. Um, who has any experience with Haskell? I have like this much. It's, this was really hard for me to write, <laughs> to write a factorial program in Haskell. <laughs> but that's, that's the thing with Haskell. And we'll see, you, when you move to something like Haskell, you lose other things. You, you try <laughs> so where we were in assembler, and we needed to work really hard to read stuff from the console. And then we went to C, where it was really easy. And we're Haskell, and now everything's difficult again. <laughs> it's really annoying. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to open this GHCI which is, and it's a bit slow on the WSL. Uh, this is the Haskell kind of interactive environment. So I'm going to copy in this factorial thing, and you'll kind of see this is how it works. So if I just want a factorial, if you open a program and book, and they're like, how to do a factorial in Haskell, they tell you, just do that. And like factorial 1, it's 1. Factorial 5, it's 120. Factorial like that, 
Yes, it can do a number as big as you can imagine. Pretty big, huh? You see, you, you kind of gain something. Like when they say factorial n, by the way, you, you see that? That's the, that's the kind of the, uh, the, how do you call it, the forward declaration. It tells you what types are in and what types it will produce. It says that integral. Now, Haskell has something called type classes, where we abstract. Like, imagine C sharp, you have generics, and Haskell has abstract generics. It has higher order generic generics. It gets really complicated. So I basically say A can be any integral. It can be an integer. It can be a number. And it's going to decide, based on what you call it with, what it's going to do. So 5 is 100. It, it outputs 120, which that's an integer. Put 500. That's no longer an integer. That's something special. So we wrote one line of Haskell. We wrote this. And it actually did quite a lot. It did stuff that would be very difficult in C and suicide in assembler. But now, how do we read from the command line? How do we put something on, out on the console? Now it becomes complicated again. All this code is just to do that, because Haskell is a pure functional library. You cannot have functions that produce side effects. Um, now, you also uh, cannot, so basically when you write a peer function, the idea is that the function will always return the same thing if it's called with the same arguments. So how do you read something from the command line if it's the function that should always return the same thing? Well, how do you print something to the console if it's not supposed to produce any side effects? So uh, you've got some stuff. How do you convert a string to an integer if the output might be an invalid integer? Remember, Haskell doesn't have the idea of just return zero, just return null. It needs to be something special. So even reading, converting an integer to a string is no longer, or, or vice versa, is no longer simple. <coughs> so for example, this thing, this process function, it converts a string to an integer. But I needed to create another function that calls another function. This, this function only calls another function. When you have an assignment in Haskell, you can think of that as like I'm defining a function. Because Haskell is so high level, it says like, when I say f of x equals x plus 1, it's like math. It's like saying, well, we're not going to execute this function, but we'll describe what it will do if you were to execute it. Haskell is not in the real world. It's in a world where nothing ever changes. So we're just describing what will happen if you call what will happen if you call factorial n? Well, it will be the product from 1 to n. What if n is infinity? Well, it doesn't matter. We're just describing what will happen. It, it's like, it's not, I, can, I can write like this. Like that. If I did that, that's valid Haskell. Like, l let, me, let me do this. I say everything equals like that. I, I just write a function that will return every number. The, like, every number doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'll just do this, and it'll just spit out numbers until the end of time, because you asked for everything. <laughs> um, that's kind of the way it works. You're kind of just describing how things would happen if you were to execute it, but nobody executes programs in Haskell. It's just kind of an idea. So I've got an idea here of reading an int, but it it's, it takes a string, it returns maybe an integer, maybe it doesn't. Um, we don't know, but we have to specify that this function might return an integer and it might not. Um, so then I have a case statement. It returns read maybe in of, and if it returns a number, we say just i, and this just and nothing is like special in ways that I don't, honestly don't fully understand. It's uh, all about, it's actually a case statement in Haskell doesn't like, Equate. It's more like pattern matching, so I can have a variable. C sharp has these nowadays. It's it's pretty old that func functional languages have that. You can have like just i. I can be anything, and we will use i. But if it is just something, we will print factorial with that something. If it is nothing, we will just print usage. And you will see this function returns i o. Now that that i o where that it returns, that's kind of think about it like async in C sharp or a promise in JavaScript. It's, it's this whole idea of monads, which they have a saying that if you learn and understand what monads are, you lose the ability to explain what monads are to someone else. So I cannot explain to you what monads are. Sorry. 
And you can, you can decide by yourselves whether that is because I don't understand them or because I do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it returns <laughs> a thing. But again, it's like we're describing what would happen if this program were to run. It's not like, we're not, this is not imperative. Which is why it just kind of returns the result of the operation. Like printing to the console and it needs to do that, which is annoying. But this stuff, even though it seems quite esoterical, this stuff really had a lot of influence in other things. For example, the whole idea of async, async in JavaScript and C-sharp especially is coming from this. Uh, Haskell had a tremendous amount of influence on C-sharp, by the way, and vice versa. Um, uh, you, anybody work with link to SQL or, or language integrated query in C-sharp? Anyone? That comes from Haskell's uh, 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 list comprehensions. Um, and C-sharp's List comprehensions, which is what link is, is, is really, as far as I've seen, better than anything else out there. It's very well thought out. It's very well implemented. <coughs> and it comes from this, the idea that the ideas that come from Haskell, the pure functional ideas. C-sharp async's the same, and promises from JavaScript the same. The fact that you call a function and you're not returning a result, you're returning kind of the idea of <laughs> what the function will return, like a promise. It's not returning something, but it's promising to return something eventually. That's kind of, it comes from this. Um, and Haskell did it just because they wanted to stay pure, but we're using it now because we want to more control over asynchrony. And we want more control over how our programs flow. So this seems crazy, and it is. Trust me, some, very few people use Haskell in production, and those people hate themselves. Um, it's some kind of masochistic thing, it must be. Um, <coughs> but it, it, they do this, they, they do this, the fact that you cannot write to a console without doing something weird, out of principle, out of the philosophy that they're trying to do. Um, anyway, let's run this program and see how it works. Um, I'm going to compile this program. GHC, GHC stands for the Glasgow Haskell compiler, which is the de facto standard Haskell compiler. Oh. Yes, you probably fix that, yeah. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? It'll, it'll try very hard to execute it because, you know, it's all about idea of executing stuff. <laughs> you see? Again, Windows subsystem for, Lin for Linux is a bit slow on, on Windows. It'll be faster on Linux, not 44. Let's run it. Run factorial. The first thing you will notice, it's slow. Now, it's slow, like I said, it's slower on Windows than it will be on Linux, but it's still slow. And it's slower than the factorial function that we write in assembly. Um, it prints us the usage. Let's say factorial um, 20, or let's say 5, which, you know, that's 120. You've seen that before. 120. And then, of course, like I've shown you before, we can put 5,000 in there. So it'll spit out a whole bunch of numbers on the console. Let's try 50,000. Let's see how long that takes. Yep, it goes. It it, it executes rather quickly for considering what it just did, but <coughs> uh, it can do that. So that's kind of the thing that you gain. Um, you can just write kind of what the idea is behind the program. And the, glass, the Haskell type system and the way that it's implemented all these things, it kind of makes this magic, which is really nice. If you didn't have to do all this stuff, and in a language like Python, with C-sharp, you don't have to do all this stuff. But you can just write that. And that's kind of the, the thing that you win. You write simpler code that, that kind of just is, again, this kind of, I'm just right explaining how the program works. I'm not imperatively programming it. Um, and that's kind of the best of both worlds. And I chose Haskell specifically because it isn't the best of both worlds. It's the best of only one world the pure functional, hypothetical, non-existent world where people write code like that. Now, um, let me show you what we paid for all of that. That's a 1.2 megabyte executable. <laughs> and uh, let's, uh, let's open IDA and see what that is. Um, <laughs> don't save. Now, here we go. Disassemble the file, and we see we've got everything. We, we, we're looking at directory names, pause. We're looking at get G, GID, which is getting the user ID. Why does it need to do that? 
because it's getting the whole Haskell runtime and everything is in there. <coughs> everything that you could possibly do in Haskell is somehow in our application now because that's how Haskell works. And so we've got like, look at, that's a, a lot of functions that, we, that are not important. Now you could probably use some flags and optimize it a bit more uh, if you're smarter than I am and that maybe know Haskell a bit better than I do, but you're still going to have some overhead. It's still going to be megabytes of like literally just like that's a 1.2 megabyte executable. That megabyte is not in data. It's in code. Look how much like if you look at the, the bluey stuff, that's code. And the orange stuff, that's probably data or maybe more likely code that hasn't been realized that it's there yet. Well, that kind of looks like data. But look, that's because it's got all these strings in there. Program, including any of the like those are messages that the pro program will never print out. But it's kind of doesn't have a mechanism to know that. So it needs to include it. So, and that's kind of the same thing with when you use something like C Sharp or JavaScript. What's the, sh what's the smallest JavaScript ap application you can write? Somebody give me an idea. What's the smallest JavaScript application you can write? You can make a JS file that just says console.log, right? It's like 10 bytes until you realize that uh, I, prob I haven't, no, I don't have Node installed. Let, let me try command line. Um, I've got node there. How big is node? Backslash. So there we go. That's a 24 megabyte executable. You want to put an H in. You Linux people. 24 megabytes. Um, let me zoom in. 24 megabytes for Node. So really, the smallest Node.js application you can write is 24 megabytes large. It makes Haskell look like a nothing. So you can see, <coughs> even though the smallest Node.js application you can write is maybe 10 bytes, you need that 24 megabytes to run it. So really, even though I'm s we can look at this Haskell and laugh, 1.2 megabytes, it's nothing compared to what we do every day. Um, the same with C Sharp. C Sharp, nice. You need the entire .NET framework for a simple C Sharp application to run. And now they've got the native compilation stuff coming, but nobody's going to use that, let's be honest. Um, so Java as well, you need the Java runtime environment, which is maybe a bit smaller than .NET, but we're using high level and higher level languages, which helps us to write programs. But there is a trade-off. We've got larger executable sizes. We have less control over what the processor does. And as processors get faster, this is less and less important until you start doing things such as machine learning and you realize that if you pr want to process terabytes of data, you really need to make sure that it does it as fast as possible. So we're using GPUs. And the people who program GPUs, well, uh, until about like a year or two ago, they were writing assembly again on GPUs uh, to make sure that, because that was the only thing that you could do right now. Oh, boy. Right now, you can write uh, programs for GPUs in C++, but again, it's not really simple. By the way, um, if you're ever programming C GPUs, GPU doesn't have a stack. That's pretty interesting. So um, uh, there's, uh, there again, you kind of start in a world where you're getting close to the metal, and you can write in a high-level programming language, but you really need to understand how the hardware works, and you really need tools that can allow you to, to uh, control the hardware very specifically. So even though we looked at, at assembly x86, these skills, like you might think that we just wrote a program in assembly, and uh, what a waste of time to learn how all this. It might be like interesting, but it's not very useful. But there are many places where you will program today where you will need to write assembly, whether it's writing machine learning code for GPUs, or whether it's writing device drivers, or whether it's writing code for Arduinos, embedded processors, writing code for cell phones. Th learning this stuff is valuable. Knowing how the stack works, how, how virtual memory works, it's not very relevant for the everyday programmer, but it's important to know. In the same way, knowing how Haskell works might seem like it's really annoying to understand how monads work. But it really is relevant to your everyday programming. Like I, sh like I showed you, m s these ideas that are put forward in Haskell are present in JavaScript and C Sharp. And I promise you that somebody who understands Haskell, even if they don't understand JavaScript, if they go into a JavaScript environment, they have more tools to work with 
than you do. So do yourself a favor and learn how assembly works and learn how, how Haskell works and Scala and Python and all these various programming languages because even if you don't use them every day, you will learn something that is applicable. Because Haskell, even though nobody programs in it, has influenced a lot of the language you use today. C, even though, well, Linux is still in C, Windows is in C, so a lot of people still use C, but again, C sharp, well, there's a reason there's a C in front of the sharp. Uh, and the same with all the other things. It's, it's maybe an interesting, maybe an interesting thing to look at how to solve a factorial in these different languages, but it's still relevant skills. And so uh, I hope that the next time we have the big sort, somebody writes it in Assembler and somebody writes it in Haskell. Here we go. Thanks, cool. everyone. Cool. Questions. We have a couple of questions. First of all, round of applause for Celia. Oh, thanks. And Seth has a question. Question over there. Disclaimer, I barely understand Assembler and Haskell, so sorry if I can't use that. So yeah. which, which Carter took you the longest to write? The Assembler, Haskell, or C? In the end, it was the Assembler. <laughs> the Haskell was winning there. I took several hours to write the Haskell example because I don't understand Haskell at all. But Assembler, I had so much problems debugging that thing because Assembly is one of those programming languages which teaches you that humans, my, human brains don't work properly. <laughs> I'm telling you, you get that one instruction missing and you're opening up GDB and you don't understand why your application is sig faulting and you realize that, oh yes, that register that I didn't think I changed, yes, I changed it. <laughs> so yes, assembly took the longest. It's also the most code. It's annoyingly complicated to write. So, just with the assembly and stuff and taking, comparing it to Haskell and stuff, simplicity always wins out in the end when it comes to, you know, just building ideas and stuff. But Very good principle, yeah. Do you find, for example, C, you can actually include assembler segments into C functions? Do you see that that's still going to be a big use? Um, no. Uh, I know that because many, many places where people use, and that's a thing, that's a thing that happens in C and C++, where people use assembly, like you can, I don't know what, what it is in GS, GCC, that's what it does, is in Visual C++. People do that because they think they can outsmart the compiler. Um, and sometimes they can, but more and more these days with modern processors, it's not true anymore. So in C++, for example, Anybody who's programmed C++ for a long time would pretty much say, you should never do it because you cannot outsmart the compiler. The compiler is designed to generate code that will run fast the CPU. So you probably won't be able to do something better than the CPU. Um, the only place where you're likely to see that kind of thing is if you're writing kernel code or you're writing code for embedded processors. When you, you're doing something that simply isn't possible in C, for example, calling an interrupt. I don't have a function to call an interrupt in C. But if you're writing an embedded programming, you might want to call an interrupt for some very specific thing. But even so, if you like take the Arduino code, Arduino is your program in C, and they go to great lengths to make sure that you don't need to program an assembler, an AVR assembler. Um, <coughs> because, like you said, simplicity wins. So, though, if you maybe go back 10, 20 years, you would find that there are these gaps. And I remember when I, I picked up a Windows 3 programming book that I have at home. And everything is in C, except that one section which tells you how to print. <laughs> because if you want to print, you need to send bytes out the parallel port. So it says, yeah, here you need to use assembler to call that interrupt. And they go to great length to show you how to minimize the amount of assembler that you need to write. These days, if you're writing user space code, which is what we're all doing, you're pretty much never going to have to do that. There won't be anything that you cannot do, and there will pretty much be nothing that you're better at than a compiler. More or less. Thanks. Any more questions? I won't burst your bubble. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel there's a... So let's go back to Haskell. So Haskell is... The cool thing about Haskell is that it is a nice platform to explain the algorithm that you're solving. So if you see the actual Haskell code, you see, okay, cool, that's the algorithm. But if you translate that back into C or even assembly, you look at the code and you go like, what the F are you trying to do here? Like, I have yeah. no, no clue. Yeah. So do you think there's a space or a middle ground where you have the, like the higher developer or the, like the, I would say, 
white tower architect type developer that goes and defines the algorithm that you want to solve, but they're going to write it in a functional code and you have a transpiler that just puts it into something that is not crappy as slow. Do you think there's a space for that? Or? And I think that, that really is the ideal. That's the thing that the holy grail of... Because there's a, there's a point that, who was it? I think it was either um, Uncle Bob that said it. Why do we have so many programming languages? How, like, we've been at this for 50 years. Shouldn't we have found one that, that's, like, good enough? And the answer is, not yet. Um, JavaScript is the most significant, the most uh, prolific programming language. And it sucks in many ways. Um, it's great in many ways. It's great at, like, this kind of stuff. Maybe not as good as Haskell. Maybe not that good in comparison to many languages, for better or for worse. But, yeah, so to come back to your point, Derek, um, that is the holy grail. And if you look at a program language like Rust, I think that's very much what they're going for. The zero overhead abstraction, where you're abstracting, but you're not paying for the abstraction. You're not, like, this, you, this is abstract, but you're paying for it. You, like we showed, we pay a lot for it. It's slower, it's more heavy, um, it, but it... it you, you, you get the simplicity, but you paid for it. When you get to zero overhead abstraction, which is the idea behind C++ and Rust, you want that abstraction, but you don't want to pay for it. But I've programmed in Rust. You pay for it. It's complicated. Because Rust, Rust, Rust I think, really tries to get at that idea where you can have lambda functions, you can have functional code, but it compiles to the simplest machine code that you can. Like, you won't be able to get those features if you try to write in a sync. That's kind of the idea. Um, but it's simply not true. It's, it's really complicated. Rust is really complicated, in my experience anyway. I haven't done it a lot, but that their type system is complicated to navigate through because they're trying to do this. So maybe we're not smart enough. Maybe we just need to get smarter and write more complicated code. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Derek is smarter than I am, by the way. <laughs> He's just kind of... <laughs> <laughs>